Hi, I'm Daniel Lickies, and welcome to Book 101. Uh, Book 101 is all about the books that I read for the last 40 years, and today I have my special guest. He's the author of several books, no other than Mr. Paul Clark. Hi, Daniel. How are you? I'm fabulous like you, Mr. Paul. And again, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah. Okay. So my name's Paul. I'm English. Uh, I grew up in Manchester and I graduated in modern history. Um, but I became a teacher of English as a foreign language. And I think my main reason for doing that job was I wanted to travel and see the world because English people or native speakers of English can work just about anywhere in the world as a teacher of English. My dream was to live in Paris, but I got a job in Italy, so I went to live in Italy. And I had a couple of years there, and a few years later I went to live in Thailand as well. I had a couple of years in Bangkok. Um, And then eventually I settled down in England and I worked as an English language teacher uh, and then sort of rose through the ranks and became a school manager and eventually became the owner of a big language school. Um, So, yeah, that's me. Um, And then I gave it all up to write. (laughs) Congratulations to your achievement, Mr. Paul. And before we go on to your next book, let's do the recap of your latest novel. Yeah, my latest novel is called The Omega Course, and it's the story of a young man who causes a road traffic accident in which another driver is killed. And it's essentially the story of how he finds a way to come to terms with what he's done. Um, And it's a very rocky road for him. He tries to find his way in religion, but this is sabotaged by someone he, he meets who kind of gives him the opposite point of view. And so there's a bit of a battle of ideas goes along, going with the conflict within him about how he's going to come to terms with the accident and what he did. Uh, and meanwhile, the police are going to prosecute prosecute him, and he could even go to jail. So he's he's got a lot of worries. Yes, people, Mr. Paul, let's talk about your trilogy. The first book of your trilogy, The Price of Dreams. How did you craft it? Okay, so this this book, uh, it's the first book I ever tried to write. And I think I started writing around about the year 2000, something like that. Um, and it was a response to the, the fall of communism, which was the, the biggest event, the biggest geopolitical earthquake of my lifetime, really. Um, so it was a response to the fall of communism in Europe, which in some parts of Europe was a fantastic liberation and societies which have been very repressive, became democratic, but in other parts of Europe was actually a bit of a disaster, uh, particularly in Yugoslavia, which fell apart with ethnic conflict, with with war between the Serbs and the Croats, followed by a three-way war in Bosnia, which was an absolutely awful, catastrophic war. Um, This war kind of had quite a big impact on on me. I, I ended up teaching some Bosnian refugees and I got a first-hand account of them from them about just how awful the war was. And early in the war, I read a story. um, There were two stories that inspired me, really. One was a a guy, um, I'm just trying to think of his name, Josip Rihil Kerr was his name. He was a policeman in Croatia who, as the countdown to war between the Serbs and the Croats was going on, he was going round arranging ceasefires between Serbian villages and Croatian villages because the area was very ethnically mixed. Um, And he put his life at risk going between the different villages and eventually he was shot and killed. Um, A very tragic death and very soon after his death, the war between the Serbs and the Croats started. The second thing I read about which inspired me was the story, this was right early in the Bosnian War, just after the Bosnian War started. And there was a story in the newspaper about two commanders, 
One was the commander of a Serb army, and the other was a commander of a, a Bosnian Muslim army. Uh, and they were commanders in a very small part of Bosnia, and they were all friends. They'd gone to, they'd been in the military together, in the Yugoslav military for a long time, and they were good friends. And what they tried to do was to keep the conflict clean. So they were working together to try and make sure the prisoners of war were treated properly and that civilians were treated properly. That, you know, we're, we're going to fight the war, but we'll try and keep civilians out of it and we'll try and keep um, prisoners of war treated properly. And eventually the, the Muslim commander was very badly injured and he had to withdraw from the front line and their collaboration came to an end. And these stories kind of stuck with me for a long time. And then when I thought about writing the novel, um, the war was, I mean, it was a really awful war. I don't know if, if you can remember it. The, the phrase ethnic cleansing came from that war. That's where mostly where Serbs would march into a Croatian village or a Muslim village and use terror to drive the people out. So they would murder, they would rape, and everyone else would run away so that they didn't get killed or didn't get raped. And then the next village would be empty before they got there because people were so terrified. So there was a lot of ethnic cleansing going along. And what the Serbs were doing was just dreadful. But on the other hand, the Serbs had a case. In the Second World War, the Croatians and the Bosnian Muslims had united against the Serbs and they had waged a genocidal campaign against the Serbs uh, in the 1940s. And so the Serbs had a kind of memory of being victims at the hands of the Croats and the Muslims. And this is one of the things that drove them to commit such terrible atrocities. So I wanted to write the story of a good Bosnian Serb who would be loyal to his community, but at the same time, would want to protect Muslims and Croats from his community. Um, and as I was starting to write the book, I was thinking, how can I get a positive ending to this book? There's no way I can get a positive ending to this book because what happened in Bosnia was just awful. So eventually I decided to invent a country to invent an imaginary country. And I invented an imaginary country as part of the Soviet Union, as an ethnic republic within the Soviet Union called Ksodia Aktaria. Um, and I spent a long time inventing the country. I, I drew a map of the country, and then I wrote down for my own use a history of the country from the time of the ancient Greeks until 1993. And then I inserted my story into that history. And so that's how it started. So my story was of someone who became a sporting hero in the Soviet Republic. Um, and then when communism collapsed, he tried to use his celebrity status to stop the war to prevent war between the different ethnic groups within his community. So, so that's essentially what the book was about. Um, I think I told you last time I interviewed you, I, first of all, I wrote the whole story. And then I tried to find an agent. And as you probably know, finding an agent is extremely difficult. Yes. The average agent in the UK gets 3,000 uh, submissions every year unsolicited submissions, of which on average they take three to try and publish them. <laughs> yes. So you literally have a one in a thousand chance of finding an agent, unless you're either very lucky or you're very good. Anyway, I spent several years trying to find an agent and eventually I found one, which was great. Um, and he did a fantastic job, didn't cost me a penny, um, he edited the book and he gave me a lot of help in, in getting the book ready for publication. And then when we finished, I met him and he said, do you know what? I think this book is too long. 
and you, I won't be able to find your publisher. It's too long. It needs to be changed. And he said, don't make it shorter, make it longer and turn it into a series. Um, so that's how it became a trilogy, um, somewhat against my initial expectations. So when I turned it into a trilogy, I had to decide, okay, where am I going to cut it? So you have to find logical places within the story to cut it. And I decided the first part of the book, or the first book, would be about my protagonist living under the communists. And he really can't stand the communists. He's part of uh, an ethnic republic within the Soviet Union. He doesn't like the Russians, and he wants independence from the Russians. He wants capitalism restored, and he wants democracy. Um, and he's a quite an arrogant young man, and he doesn't mind who knows it. You know, he doesn't make much of a secret of his contempt for the communists uh, and of his dislike of the Russians. Um, but the only trouble is, at the same time, he wants to be an athlete. And in order to be an athlete, you have to be a good boy. And there's a bit of a contradiction between his attitude towards the communists and his ambition. So basically, in order to achieve his dreams, he's going to have to kowtow in some way to the communists. So the book is about his struggle under communism to maintain his integrity and at the same time have a career as an athlete within the system. Hence the title, The Price of Dreams. Interesting, Mr. Paul. So can you describe the main characters or themes in The Price of Dreams? Yeah, so we meet our protagonist. His name is Ruslan and he's a student. Um, and he nearly got, we learned that he nearly got thrown out of university not long ago because he made an off-the-cuff anti-communist statement in a seminar. And he had to grovel and apologize and get around that. And soon after we meet him, he gets into a fight with one of the leaders, with the, the son of one of the leaders of the Communist Party. The two meet each other and absolutely can't stand each other. Uh, and they get into a fight. And this brings him to the attention of the KGB, the secret police, who try and recruit him to work for them. Because the KGB know he's got some rather dodgy friends and they want him to act as an informant for them. So his first dilemma is, do I work for the KGB or do I tell the KGB to get lost? Um, there's two love stories within the story. Um, there's two women, essentially, very different women who he falls in love with. The first is non-political. She becomes a medical student, and her aim in life is to be a doctor, and she doesn't care about politics. She's not interested in politics at all. The second woman he falls in love with is a university lecturer who is a dissident and who is actively involved in clandestine magazines and other clandestine activities to try and undermine the communists. And there's a bit of a choice between these two women. They, they don't quite overlap, but there's a bit of a choice between these two women. You know, which, which way is he going to go? He loves both of them. And which, which one he goes with will determine to a significant extent the course of his life. If he goes with the anti-communist, then he's going to spend his life in trouble. If he goes with the apolitical girl, then he can have a career within the system. So these are some of the themes. Um, another theme within the book is ethnic conflict, because the medical student he loves is from a different ethnic group. And his family during the Second World War suffered very badly at the, hand of, at the hands of that ethnic group. Certain members of that ethnic group collaborated with the Nazis and committed massacres, which included massacres of members of his family. 
And so there's a lot of bitterness within his family and there's people within his family who are not very happy at all at the idea of him having a girlfriend from a different ethnic group. So you've got all these things going on. Um, his heart torn between diff two different women, very, very different women. Um, his conflicts with the KGB, one of these women, her conflicts with the KGB Secret Service and ethnic conflict, the conflict between his family and her, his other girlfriend. Very well said, Mr. Paul. But before we go on, I want to shout out my listeners in Italy because you live in Italy, as you said, because in Piedmont, I got 43% yeah. audience share. Latium, Lombardy, Tuscany, Trentino, Alto Adige. Okay, I lived, in, I lived in Lombardy. I lived in Milan. Wow, that's Saluti. Saluti. Grazie mille tutto, Italy, Italy, for supporting this podcast. Of course, in Emilia Romana, Veneto, or Veneto, Aquila, Campania, Sicily, Calabria, and a lot more. Oh, grazie mille tutto, Italy, for supporting this podcast because this podcast is created to empower writers, authors all over the world, like Mr. Paul Clark. So, Mr. Paul, did you draw any personal experiences when crafting story or characters of the book? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, when you draw on your personal experience, if you've got personal conflicts within you, uh, putting them in a novel is a great way to resolve those conflicts. Um, and the two women in my novel, I, dr I draw them from women in my life. Let's just put it that way. Um, they're not 100% based on these women, but the differences between them do reflect differences between women that I've loved in my life. Yeah. Definitely. So what do you hope readers will take away from your book after finish reading it? The Price of Dreams. What a lot of readers have taken away from the book. Um, one reader said, or several readers said, they really like the central character, Ruslan. They identify with him um, and they root for him. You know, they, they want him to succeed. Um, one reviewer put that whenever Ruslan was presented with a dilemma and he's presented with several dilemmas as, as the story progresses, they were asking themselves, what would I do in that situation? Uh, and that, that's something that I, I thought was great that, that people would ask themselves that question. Would I do the same as him in that situation where he did what might seem like the wrong thing? Well, would, is that what I would do? Where he did what might seem like a crazy thing to do? Well, is that what I would do? So, you know, I, I hope people identify, especially with the central character, um, and identify with the dilemmas that he's faced with. I think in Western society, we're not faced with the dilemma of, you know, am I going to be politically persecuted? But sometimes we could find ourselves working for a company which we don't really like. And you have to ask yourself, do I stay with this company I don't like very much because it's good for my career and I need to pay the rent or I need to pay the mortgage? Or do I leave this company that I don't like but take the risk of not being able to pay the rent and not being able to pay the mortgage? So it is, it is the kind of dilemma that people can have in Western society too. Definitely. So, Mr. Paul, were there any particular authors or books that influence your writing style or content of The Price of Dreams? Um, I'm trying to think of any books that influence The Price of Dreams a lot. I mean, I, I said last time we spoke, my, my favorite um, authors are probably George Orwell and Graham Greene. Um, and... There's quite a lot of politics in this book. And, you know, George Orwell was a very political writer. It's not, not a fantastic amount of politics. You, you can read it without being very interested in politics, but there is politics in there. And so probably George Orwell, um, in terms of style and to a certain extent in terms of content, yeah, I think would have inspired him. 
Interesting, Mr. Paul. So can you share a memorable, memorable moment from your writing journey that had a significant impact on the price of dreams? Okay, a memorable moment from my writing journey. Um, I can remember I decided to include some ethnic conflict in there. Uh, when the Soviet Union began to fall apart, there were a lot of areas of the Soviet Union which were very ethnically mixed. And within those areas, um, different groups would be vying for supremacy. So one of the areas which actually came, I wrote this around about the year 2000, something like that. It came back in the news about two or three years ago was Nagorno-Karabakh. Nagorno-Karabakh was an area of Azerbaijan where the population is mostly Armenian. And the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh were rebelling against Azeri rule. And this had a direct impact on my characters. Um, my central character, Ruslan, and his wife were living in Azerbaijan, and his wife looks like an Armenian. And this brought them a lot of trouble and made life very difficult for them. So what I had to do, this was, I was researching this around about the year 2000 when I started researching this. And the internet was not then what it, what it is today. Um, the nickname was the World Wide Wait yes. because it took so long to find anything on the internet. And I, I think I wasn't very used to finding things on the internet. So this is one where I had to go to the local library and find, in the local library, I could find the London Times from when this conflict broke out in Nagorno-Karabakh and go back and read the Times from, from those days. Um, it'd be a lot easier to research it now because you just go Google, click, Wikipedia, click, um, and you'd, you'd find things very, very quickly. But in those days, it, it was quite an effort to, to do the research. So I wrote about uh, an explosion of ethnic conflict that happened in Azerbaijan, where my central characters were involved. And then you have to work very hard to try and make it accurate what you're writing, if you're writing about real historical events, because you don't want to distort it. So I had to spend quite a lot of time researching it and, you know, try and get it right, what happened. And I think I did get it right, um, but you're always a bit nervous that you may have got it wrong. Yes, definitely. So how important was research for I the I price of drinks? It was quite funny. Um, the, mm -hmm. There was one part where there was an explosion of ethnic violence. And then I decided there would be somebody interviewed on TV who said they didn't see anything. And so I thought, I'm going to name this guy Tofik Bakramov. Tofik Bakramov is quite famous. He was uh, the assistant referee in the 1966 World Cup final, which was won by England. And in the World Cup final, our third goal wasn't a goal. The ball never crossed the line. But Tofik Bakramov, uh, he said the ball did cross the line. And so we were awarded the goal. So I thought, OK, I'm going to have the worst eyewitness in history who says there was no violence, nothing happened at all. And I'll call him Tofik Bakramov. So that's kind of a little joke that I buried deep in the text for anyone who might think, oh, Tofik Bakramov, yeah, I know him. Anyway, so I wrote that. And then a few years later, I went to Azerbaijan. I went on a business trip to Azerbaijan. And I discovered that Tofik Bakramov is very famous in Azerbaijan. And the national stadium is named after him. And I thought, oh, I can't do that then. So I just I changed his first name and just kept the name Bakramov. But I was a bit disappointed that I couldn't keep the name Tofik Bakramov. But, you know, he was, he was a very prominent figure enough in Azerbaijani sport. I can't really use him as the worst eyewitness in history. Certainly. Interesting facts, Mr. Mr. Paul. So what message or lesson, if any, would you like your book? to impart to the readers? 
one of the messages is about integrity. One of the questions the book is asking is, you know, where you have to choose between your integrity and your comfort, should you choose your integrity? And I want readers to go away and think about that question. Um, the other message is one of ethnic tolerance, that one of the themes of the book is ethnic conflict, and my characters are very much on the side of let's avoid conflict between different ethnic groups, let's listen to each other, um, you know, it's one world and we all have to live together. Mm, definitely. So before we go on, Mr. Paul, I'm inviting you to please do listen to my other podcast, Food 101, our fourth season with Chef Alessandro, one of the best executive chefs in one of the five star hotel in downtown Toronto. So please do listen to our latest episode. We talk about pasta, 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 people. And for sure, our books are out too, people, from uh, Food 101, Volume 1, Basics, until 13 volumes. Available on Amazon and leading online bookstores worldwide. So, Mr. Paul, is there a specific scene or chapter in The Price of Omega that holds special meaning to you? Um, a specific scene. I think um, one of the best scenes is... I don't want to give away too many spoilers. Yeah, okay, one one scene quite early in the book. Um, Ruslan, the hero, is cornered by the KGB. He's been involved in a fight with the son of a leading communist, and they're threatening him with a very long period in prison. And they're basically saying to him, if you don't work for us, we're going to make sure you end up in prison. And he spends a night wondering what to do. You know, what do I do? Do I do it this way? Do I do it that way? And eventually, um, I got this from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's book, The Gulag Archipelago. Archipelago it, he tells one incident where the Russian Secret Service, this is during Stalin's purges, the Russian Secret Service went to arrest a man and Usually when they go and arrest someone, the people go, what, me, what for? I haven't done anything. But this guy jumped out of his window and ran away. And they never tried to arrest him again. He lived a charmed life after that, basically because the, the KGB or the NKVD, as they were then, they were bureaucrats who wanted an easy life. And if someone was difficult to arrest, they weren't going to arrest them. They would arrest someone else. So I decided that Ruslan would instead of working for the KGB, he would tell them to go away using the strongest language possible, which he did. Um, and it, it's kind of a, a chapter ending. You know, the KGB say, well, you're going to work for us, or you're going to go to prison. What are you going to do? And he turns around to them and he says, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to repeat it here, but he uses very, very strong language, telling them to go away. And then chapter ending, and then the next chapter, you have to read about five pages to see what happened after that. Um, and that, that was fun to write. Wow. I enjoyed Thank writing. Thank you for sharing to us without the spoiler. <laughs> what do you think the price of dreams stands out in each genre or category? I would call it a thriller. Um, it's a political thriller, but... If you say political thriller, a lot of political thrillers, somebody's uncovering a vast conspiracy. There's none of that here. It's a thriller about someone who's caught up in politics. And my agent told me it was a semi-literary thriller. So it, it's not quite it's not quite literary fiction, but it, it's halfway there. So a semi-literary political thriller. A semi. Okay, that's awesome. And are there any plans for uh, uh, up, what do you call upgrading the trilogy to a series? I, I kind of, I haven't called it a trilogy. I've called them the Russell and Shinitsa novels to give me the option. 
mm-hmm, yes. of a fourth novel if I want to. Um, sometimes I think I might sort of go 20 years later or something like that or 10 years later um, and do an update, but there's no plans at the moment. I'm too busy doing other things. <laughs> busy doing the audiobook. <laughs> For sure. So, Mr. Paul, can you please invite our listeners to support The Price of Dreams? Yeah. So, if you are interested in a novel about a very engaging character living in the Soviet Union in the last 10 years of communist rule, struggling to keep his integrity, and at the same time to have a successful career as an athlete, then I think you can enjoy this book. It's got dilemmas, moral dilemmas that he faces. It's got conflict, ethnic conflict um, between people he knows and people he loves, and ethnic conflict that he and his wife later get caught up in. And it's got two very moving love stories as well. So I hope you can enjoy it. Yes, people, let's support Mr. Paul, because if we support him, more, 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 more books to come. Who knows, this uh, book series, uh, book trilogy will become book series, The Price of Dreams. And next week, we're going to talk about the second book of this uh, trilogy. What is the next book for this, Mr. Paul? Okay, the second book is called A Long Night of Chaos. Um, And this title, it came from a quotation from Alexander Herzen. Alexander Herzen was a Russian liberal in the 19th century who was writing about how when one kind of regime falls, what's left is not the birth of a new regime. Instead, what's left is a pregnant widow. Uh, This is a Martin Amis used the other half of this quotation. When the empire falls, what's or the dictatorship falls, what's left is a pregnant widow. And between the death of the old and the birth of the new, a long night of chaos will go by. And there will be a great deal of suffering during this long night of chaos. So this is the period between the, the, the death of the old, communism, and the birth of the new, the post-communist regime. So everything is to play for during this period and all sorts of things are going on and it's not a good time. So that's how I got the title of A Long Night of Chaos. Oh, interesting, Mr. Paul. Looking forward for our next episodes and let's talk about your second book. So, Mr. Paul, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. More to come, people. See you soon.